everybody and welcome to Rome. My name is Nina and I'm a licensed tour guide uh, in Rome. I work as a, a tour guide here in Rome and I'm very happy today to show you one of my favorite spots. I'm talking about the Circus Maximus that you can see here. Um, let me tell you why this is one of my favorite spots because I'm an archaeologist. I'm a PhD archaeologist so this is why I'm very happy to share with you all I know about this area. So, but before we talk about this incredible place, the, our today's superstar, I want to introduce you briefly uh, the area where we are right now. So this is a very um, uh, central location, we are in a very um, uh, nice area, pretty close to everything. First of all, if you look to your left, uh, this way, you'll see um, some bronze horses on the top of a white building. That is the Fatherlands out there, um, right uh, next to Venice Square. And this, for example, a place that you can visit uh, soon after and maybe visit of the Colosseum or the area here. What about the, uh, the Colosseum? Well, it's right behind this hill. And this is a very special hill of Rome. I'm talking about the Palatine Hill the place where the emperors lived and the ruins you can see they belong to the imperial palace built between the first and the third century AD uh, and then abandoned especially when the emperor Constantine decided to move the, um, the capital from uh, Rome to Constantinople the more in Istanbul um, so the Palatine Hill uh, it's a, a place that you can visit together with the Colosseum and the Roman Forum during your ancient Rome tour and maybe at the end of your ancient Rome tour you can walk just it's about 10 minutes from there to explore this beautiful area and if you're not too tired let me give you another suggestion is to explore why don't you explore this other hill right across the street this is the beautiful Aventine hill I truly love it. It's a very residential area and uh, uh, a lot of uh, VIP and actors, uh, very wealthy businessmen, and they all live up here. Uh, there are no supermarkets, no groceries, no pharmacies. <laughs> we used to say that if you have enough money to buy an apartment or a house up there, you also guys have enough money to send someone to the supermarket and grab food for you, trust me. And um, what you can uh, admire up here is a series of lovely medieval churches and uh, a beautiful public garden from where to have a breathtaking view of Rome. Our skyline is amazing, it's unique in the world. And if you love flowers, let me suggest you to take a look at the beautiful rose garden, which is right across the street where you see some uh, those gates. Nowadays, unfortunately, and at the moment, it's closed because it opens only during the month of May and June when the roses are blooming and they're so fragrant. You cannot imagine the scent. It's incredible. And uh, uh, let me tell you, over a thousand uh, of different varieties of roses uh, um, uh, they, uh, they're cultivated right there. Uh, they come from all over the world. In the 1600s, uh, the area was uh, used as a, um, um, a cemetery by the Jewish community. And only in the 1900s, the municipality decided to create, to establish there a public rose garden. Uh, what is very nice is the fact that to thank the Jewish community for this donation, they decided to shape the footpath of the garden um, I mean designed as a menorah. So it's something very nice and very cool you cannot miss. So this is my little introduction, very short introduction about the area. But now it's time to talk about this area right here this flat area, a sort of depression, a sort of valley between the Palatine Hill, I already mentioned, and the Aventine Hill. We call it the Circus Maximus. I know, I know you are thinking right now, in this moment, this guy is crazy. What is this? It's just a, um, a grassy area, oval shaped area, nothing special. No guys, this is what is remaining of uh, the biggest public building ever built in ancient Rome. Uh, it 
was extraordinary as a miracle of architecture, unfortunately uh, poorly um, preserved because especially uh, with Mussolini in the 1900s he organized some events here so placing some stands, some structures so they made very deep excavations to place all the structures destroying great part of the ancient Roman walls and uh, I mean, remains and you can see over there right over there some of the ancient Roman structures, just the upper part, because the original truck level is, was like an arena, okay, level, is more or less 15 feet below ground. So we can find it, we know it's there, but it's 15 feet below ground. So this building, this area, was used by and for, for to do what? To organize, to set up chariot races. So the horse racing was so popular in ancient Roman times. It was a kind of spectacle, probably the oldest and the most popular and um, so all the Romans loved both the horse racing but also the games that took place and the animal hunting and the gladiatorial fights that took place at the Colosseum, for example. But the horse races, they were very, very popular, trust me. So then the story of this place started in the past and probably in the 8th century before Christ, so BC, at the time of the first king of Rome, Romulus. Probably, you know, Romulus has been the founder of my city. Mm, you know, the story says there were two, these two twin, twin brothers, Romulus and Remo. Then Romulus, he killed his brother Remo and he founded Rome. Uh, at a certain time, uh, he decided to organize some spectacles here dedicated to consuls, uh, um, a deity very popular at the time related to agriculture, especially agriculture and granaries. Um, so, he organized some spectacles, but you know what, he wanted to do something different. Um, it was a sort of uh, a show organized to adopt, okay, and then also to rape some women because they are known <laughs> their own and so this is why they, he organized these spectacles At, um, a lot of people came he has to invite all the neighboring people all the sabines came population living nearby and uh, at a pre-arranged signal all the young soldiers, uh, they try to, uh, they start into taking all the women and they have been uh, then moved uh, here to Rome and to the senators' houses at the time. So this area, this is the extent that this area was known and used as a place where to set up shows, spectacles, games since the time of the kings of Rome. Then, especially with the Tarquins and with the, the king Tarquinio Prisco, he probably set up um, and he created some wooden structures, seats, wooden seats, okay, to allow people to get in, to stay, and to feel comfortable during these uh, um, uh, um, uh, horse um, uh, races. And then it's only, but it's only with the Julius Caesar and then Augustus that the area changed completely and because they created more stable and more stable and structures probably made of stones and made of bricks the carceres carceres were like the uh, horses um, stalls they were this way by the short side okay so this way by the short side and at the very beginning they were made of wood then transformed into little areas divided by tiny walls um the chariot races <laughs> okay it's modern chariot racing yeah modern chariot <laughs> races you see they're very good very good charioteers <laughs> <laughs> this is what we can see they're very good charioteers very sporty <laughs> 
so the, the, the horses they started from there they left around the central barrier um, but I want to tell you more about the horse race later okay so for the moment just uh, uh, talk a little bit about the story of this place so it started um, uh, since Romulus time uh, then transformed into something more stable with the Caesar Jews Caesar and Augustus Augustus brought from Rome and uh, from Egypt um, a huge obelisk that was placed right in the middle of this uh, barrier dividing you not know, the truck in to two sides and nowadays it's no longer visible here because it's been then moved by the Pope Sixtus the fifth so in the 1500s in the second half of the 1500s and it was moved to Piazza del Popolo People's Square another obelisk was later added in the fourth century AD by the Emperor Costanzo and nowadays is visible by San Giovanni in Laterano San Giovanni Lateran Cathedral. So two great big obelisks were right now were right here. Uh, then what happened? Well, um, several emperors uh, changed it completely the building. The remains that we see over there they belong to Trajan. Okay, to Trajan time. To Trajan's time. Trajan is the one that remodeled completely the building, and he um, uh, built all the walls. All this um, he renovated completely the seating system I didn't tell you but this area could accommodate um, uh, something up to a hundred and fifty thousand people some Latin writers say they say it could accommodate up to two hundred and fifty thousand people um, uh, one Latin writer recorded 385,000 people seated in here by this uh, tiny, very uncomfortable seats. I want to be honest <laughs> with you, but I'm gonna tell you later because we can see some uh, of the rem of their remains. And so it was I mean, a place uh, completely remodeled by Trajan, then uh, restored uh, by the Emperor Constantine, uh, but later abandoned. The last games, uh, I mean, games meaning the you know, horse races um, uh, registered here, they go back to the 500s. Um, then was gradually abandoned, especially because the Christians, you know, when, when the Christianity became the official religion of the Roman Empire, Mm, let me tell you, the Christians didn't like uh, this kind of games uh, and uh, experience or this kind of entertainment. So this is why um, uh, we uh, we had this uh, um, decay, okay, of the um, uh, the horse races until the five six hundreds. And then what happened? Well, something very sad. The area has been used as a quarry, a quarry for centuries same as the Colosseum or maybe ancient Roman buildings maybe not converted into churches and for this reason protected by the popes. So um, all the precious marbles that decorated in the building and all the mosaics, all the, the stones have been stolen and reused maybe in modern Renaissance buildings or Renaissance churches. Um, then as I was explaining you, was abandoned used as a quarry but also as an agricultural area land for centuries especially during the Middle Ages there were some uh, mills nearby and um, they used uh, a stream that was here since very ancient times going toward the Tiber River the Tiber River is right behind this uh, um, uh, red building orangish building you see over there um, and uh, the stream and the water, um, I didn't tell you, has been channeled since the Roman times um, to drain okay, the area and to drain the truck. And nowadays, I mean, it's no longer visible. And then, uh, well, sadly, as I will um, explain you, uh, Mussolini decided to use this area uh, for some uh, very important events uh, and this uh, means they destroyed, okay, this meant they destroyed completely um, the remains of what was surviving of the area. Uh, now I think it's definitely time to talk about the horse races, images, imagine 
we are going back, okay, to ancient Roman times, uh, mm, like in a time machine. I'm gonna tell you everything about a typical day at the Circus Maximus. Follow me. Hi again. Uh, as we, you can see, we changed our location and now we are right in the middle of the ancient Circus Maximus. Uh, it's a huge, vast area. I didn't tell you, but uh, this area was uh, over 2,000 feet uh, long and uh, almost 400 feet wide. So it was huge. And now we are right in the middle, probably where the ancient Spina, the barrier, the central barrier was. I'm here to tell you something more about the circus and as I already promised you, something more about a typical day at the Circus Maximus. But first of all, what about the structures that are still visible here? Follow me. Let me show you. You can see over there, these are the remains quite recently excavated by the Superintendenza Capitolina. So some of my colleagues, they took care of the excavations and they found amazing stuff. First of all, you see to the left, the remains of these uh, walls. There's a sloping walls made of bricks and they were completely covered by the seats. The first ones dedicated and reserved better, reserved to the senators, uh, then uh, to uh, uh, the horse men and patricians, and then the men of uh, common Roman people. Probably the very top ones, uh, they were made of wood. Okay, and as I already explained you, they were pretty uncomfortable because very tiny and uh, so narrow seats. And uh, above all, there was any velarium here. If you heard, or maybe you already visited the Colosseum, the Colosseum, if not, it's definitely time to book your ancient Rome tour. Trust me, <laughs> and you probably heard that the Colosseum was covered by this uh, uh, bellarium, okay? It was a sort of retractable roof used to cover it and to protect people from the heat of the sun or maybe during a rainy day. Here, the, no, the bellarium didn't exist, so they never um, planned or they never planned to make one. So this is why I was explaining you many, many chariot races every day from the early morning until the late evening or maybe the evening. And uh, no, uh, the lack of the velarium, this narrow seat, was not exactly a very nice experience. But the Romans loved the, the horse racing. It was very appealing, okay, because uh, they love blood. And I didn't tell you, but uh, the, the chari charioteer, mm, uh, they, they crashed very, very often. So the races were mm, very, very dangerous. And they loved this, okay? They simply loved this violence, this blood. Um, so just some of uh, the seats, uh, of this uh, short side, would imagine there was a sort of exedra here. Um, they have been found together with very interesting remains. Uh, you see the white uh, uh, fragments, the white blocks over there, they belong to a triumphal arch. This is uh, something extraordinary discovered quite recently. They belong to a triumphal arch dedicated to the Emperor Titus. The arch was placed right there, right in the middle of this exedra, and uh, was built uh, in, uh, probably in 81 AD to celebrate the Emperor Titus soon after his death and to celebrate, above all, his victory over the Jews and the sack of Jerusalem in 70 AD. So there were two arches that were dedicated to Titus and related, connected to the sack of Jerusalem. The second one was here. It was not that big, okay? There were some columns right in the front, there were four, and probably each one was about 30 feet high. Um, uh, probably the, um, the total height was about 45 feet and on the very top was a quadriga so a four horses chariot made of bronze like the one I was showing you at the very very beginning of uh, this uh, mini tour and then um, the, um, the arch was made of this beautiful white marble directly from Luni Marmo Lunensis this uh, nowadays is known as 
Carrara marble, the, the famous uh, um, type of marble used by Michelangelo to make, for example, um, uh, the, um, uh, the David and other incredible statues. So it was very, very popular kind of marble during the Renaissance. Um, so what else? You also see something pretty weird right in the middle there of the area. What is that? This is a medieval <laughs> tower. Oh yeah, built in the 1200s and belonging to a noble Roman family, the Frangipane family. Uh, this was built uh, together with other little maybe structures and was here together with the mills and an aqueduct built by a pope in the 1100s and using the stream. Remember, I was talking about this uh, water channel that was here since ancient Roman times. Okay, so uh, for the water supply of the mills, but also of some churches and other structures nearby. Mm -hmm. Now is definitely time to talk about a day at the Circus Maximus. So imagine, the day started very early in the morning, okay? And uh, the chariot races, they were preceded by uh, the famous Pompa Circensis, a sort of a solemn procession um, um, through the streets of the city. And I mean, it ended right here in the Circus Maximus. All the major magistrates participated and the emperor was here. Well, the emperor, as I already mentioned, lived right up there okay uh, by the Palatine Hill and uh, he had a special box from where he could attend the chariot races together with his family and very VIP guests and um, another box was used I mean, for the magistrates and generally the sponsor okay of, uh, um, of uh, the, the chariot races so at the end of, of this uh, solemn procession, the attention okay, of the spectators, remember, up to 150,000 spectators shift directly to that side. That short side where the carceres, the horses stalls or the chariot stalls were. Uh, there were 12, I didn't mention this, there were 12, as I was explaining, made of wood at the very beginning, then transformed you know, into more stable um, structures and they were closed. Then what happened? The sponsor, or probably a magistrate, uh, he had the honor to, uh, to start okay, the, uh, the, um, the chariot race. How? Through, probably there was like an acoustic signal or something vocal, we don't know, but the most important part was this. He dropped a handkerchief directly on the track and the carcheras were open and so the teams exploded forward. Uh, why I'm talking about teams? Because the charioteers were divided into teams, also known as factions. There were main, four main ones, and uh, they were named by their colors, okay? So we had the blues, the reds, the greens, and the whites. We know that they cooperated each other, so they were like allied um, uh, from the early imperial time onward. And, uh, for example, the green, they cooperated, they used to cooperate with uh, the reds and uh, the blues with the whites. But the two teams, they were considered the most popular ones and uh, they enjoyed the favor of uh, um, uh, the, the emperor. And uh, so they were very, very appreciated by all the Romans. The most appreciated, they were um, the blues and the greens. So the two most popular teams ever. Hmm? And then what happened? The races started, okay, so the charioteers, they were driving, imagine the little chariot, it could be maybe two or three, up to four horses chariots, and they circle, okay, the, you know, the central barrier, the spina, for seven times, okay, so it was like a, a seven laps. Uh, a race. Um, uh, they covered uh, more or less something like uh, three miles, no more than three miles, in eight, nine minutes. And the most dangerous spots were the two, okay, the two in uh, uh, one end and the other end of the spina, when the, uh, no, they have to turn to get uh, in, in, and to turn and to reach the other long side of the track. 
that were two very dangerous moments. As I was explaining you, uh, the charioteers crashed many, many times. And they had staff, okay, professionals, assistants ready to have them directly on the track because the teams, uh, they had a sort of uh, um, a staff, a very, I'm talking about 100 professionals, 100 assistants, doctors, grooms, for example. They needed grooms because of the horses. Horses were considered like superstars, like, <laughs> like VIP, like football stars, the same as the charioteers at the time. And, and so at the end, the winner, he went directly to the box of the judges to claim his prize generally a palm branch, some money, and so on. Uh, this is what happened, okay? But this is just the one race. They could, we could have, we know that, they could organize up to 24 races per day. And uh, we know there were a total of more or less 66, um, I mean, days dedicated, okay, per year dedicated to these horse races, generally uh, maybe um, festivals, you know, occasional festivals or maybe important events uh, such as uh, um, uh, celebrations and birthday celebrations of an emperor or maybe funerals or victories uh, and so on. What I want to you know, remark again is that this was a kind of spectacle very, very appreciated by the Romans. Uh, and the charioteers were considered, I was explaining, like um, Hollywood actors or football stars, even if, let me tell you, they were um, generally slaves or maybe freed Romans. Just a few ones, we know they were um, freeborn Roman citizens, but just uh, um, a few ones. They were mainly slaves or freed men. They had a salary, they were very popular, and they had this stuff working with and for them. And uh, there was a sort of manager, a faction, um, a faction or a team manager, taking care of the charioteer, the horse, and all the stuff. Another little thing I would like to show you and tell you about the Circus Maximus and the secret is that this area was not only used for the chariot races, but let me tell you, all around the building, okay, um, more or less of where you have to imagine the outer okay, walls and the outer archways, there were little shops, the so-called taberne, little shops where the Romans, they could buy and grab some food, some wine, they need a lot of wine, they love wine too, so not only blood, and they could also find some prostitutes, so, or maybe they could bet, uh, no, um, thinking about the, 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 the chariot races, and so this is what happened, unfortunately, a great part of this taberne have been destroyed when, in 64 AD, month of July, during the Great Fire of Rome. Generally, this is known as the Nero's Great Fire of Rome. And it destroyed, I mean, great part of Rome, great part of the city center, but it started directly from here. And in particular, from this side, so from the Palatine hillside, and all the taberne, the little shop placed there, uh, they're gone uh, very quickly because generally they were made maybe um, with walls and brick walls, but mainly were made of, um, made of wood. Okay, so I think it's time to say goodbye. I hope you enjoyed my tour and I hope you enjoy this area. Uh, I'm very proud <laughs> and to be here this morning. And uh, I want to thank Alex too, because I mean, trust me, it's pretty hot, but even if it doesn't look it's pretty hot, it's doing a great job. <laughs> We're both doing a great job, I hope so. And see you next week. And I'm definitely waiting for you here in Rome. Okay, ciao, ciao from your Nina. Ciao.